Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this Tuesday Scholar event. Our speaker today is Deborah Appleman, who will address the topic Culture Wars in the Classroom. Deborah Appleman is the Hollis L. Caswell Professor of Educational Studies at Carleton College. Her latest book is Literature and the New Culture Wars, Triggers, Cancel Culture, and the Teacher's Dilemma. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Libraries. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Deborah Appleman, on the topic, Culture Wars in the Classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm going to uh, share my screen. I'm very pleased to be able to talk with you today about this important topic. There are many aspects of the culture wars and my perspective is from the perspective of a classroom teacher. I began my career as a high school teacher and I've been teaching at Carleton College as well as in some correctional facilities in the state of Minnesota as well. For me, literature is a vehicle that brings empathy, and gives us a greater understanding of our fellow human beings. And I have been so disappointed and actually surprised and worried about the ways in which our current climate has informed the kinds of teaching of literature that classroom teachers hope to do. I'd like to begin our time together by reading you something from the very beginning of my book. The political challenges of teaching literature in the 2020s come interestingly enough from both conservative and liberal fronts. Censorship used to be the province of the right, of social conservatives. Books were censored because they included too much sex or vulgar language, or in recent times, books that had gay or trans identity themes. Also, from the conservative spectrum are the usual objections based on perceived standards of appropriateness for classroom consumption, including obscenity, explicit sex, portrayals of LGBTQ plus characters and relationships, alcohol, substance abuse, and other topics. These kinds of censorship efforts are not new. Yet it is not only the pressure from the right that challenges and politicizes the teaching of literature in the 21st century. In classrooms all over the country today, from elementary to graduate school, other movements now threaten the teaching of literature. Despite my ardent support of the need to protect the vulnerable and the victimized, I do have concerns about the ways in which trigger warnings, cancel culture, and the Me Too movement have reshaped the politics of teaching literature. Additionally, cleansing the curriculum of any potentially offensive language or character portrayals has had a significant influence on what does and doesn't get taught in the classroom. So these are the kinds of issues I hope to share with you today. Um, I want to begin with a quote from James Baldwin, who says, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me were the very things that connected me with all of the people who were alive and who had ever been alive. What I think is particularly important about Baldwin's perspective is the sense that there are ways in which literature as a site of inquiry not only gives us empathy to other human beings, but also is a way in which we learn about the kinds of 
difficult, negative, and even uncomfortable and discomforting things that people have been through. This is really important to the current claims of the culture war that there are some things that are just too difficult for people to read in the classroom. James Baldwin wants us to read about them and he wants us to get connected to the pain and the heartbreak as well as the joy of others. Um, this slide that I'm showing are the top 13 most challenging books of 2022. And books are challenged, they've been challenged for uh, quite a while for lots of different reasons. As English teachers, the libraries, including the American Library Association, have been our best friends. But there are ways in which the challenges, as I said in my opening remarks, come not just from the conservative right, but also come from the left as well. The first chapter of my book is somewhat cheekily titled, Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right. Some of you who are of an age like me may remember that song from Steeler's Wheel. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you. And I find myself in an unlikely position of sometimes agreeing with people that I usually disagree with and disagreeing with people that I agree with as there are certain aspects of the culture wars that have created these unusual alliances. And I will talk about them in just a few minutes. Many of the books that are being censored are censored um, because of the kinds of topics that have been under uh, conflict for a while. So a lot of young adult literature has been censored. But there's also a lot of books that have been censored or authors that have been canceled. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Here are the four main reasons during the time we have today that I want to talk about why books are being canceled. First, objectionable content from both the left and from the right then offensive language. And that language can include things like slurs, the N-word, uh, ways in which people are being portrayed in ways that seem to marginalize characters and other groups. Then it's the content of the author. And this is one of the most problematic aspects of the culture war to me that authors are canceled, not because of the content of their book, but because of their outside of authorship behavior. And then to go back to James Baldwin's perspective, books are being canceled because the subject is triggering. So I wanna take each one of these ideas and talk about them in a little bit more detail. And I'll really look forward to your questions and comments at the end of my presentation. So the first is offensive language. And this is a topic uh, that many English teachers and other literary scholars have struggled with for a long time. So a great example is the issue that we have when we try to teach canonical texts like Huck Finn or To Kill a Mockingbird that has the N-word in it. The N-word is a word that is disgusting, horrible, and should never be said out loud, especially in a classroom context, and most especially by majority teachers in diverse, increasingly diverse classroom settings. So it seems like that should be something that is easily settled. And yet, if I go back to James Baldwin, James Baldwin, as an African-American author, uses the N-word as a dagger. He wants it to hurt. He wants it to shame. He wants it to shock. And he doesn't want 
the power of the language to somehow be muted in a particular kind of way. Um, that is debatable. There are great uh, uh, arguments on either side. It all depends on the teacher, the text, and the context. But it's one that I think as a community of people who read and teach um, and, and receive literature, that we need to complicate and think about it in a nuanced way. Another aspect of offensive language are the ways in which language changes as we move on. And one of the primary tenets of the culture wars is something that I call presentism. Presentism means that we take our 21st century sensibilities and we superimpose them on the world of the text. So in 18th century, 19th century, even 20th century text may include language and vocabulary, especially when it comes to dealing with issues of gender, gender identity, and other elements that we see now are problematic, but within the context of the author's world, were not problematic at that time. So one of the things to think about is to not just cancel a book because there are words in it that are offensive, but to trouble those words, to talk about them, and to think about what they might signify about the world and the world view of the author at the time the book was written. Another aspect um, that I mentioned briefly earlier is the conduct of the author, which is usually not book related. So there are some many instances where authors have been censored because of something that they said. A common example right now um, is the, the kerfluffle about Harry Potter, um, when J.K. Rowling has been um, found to be guilty of articulating some language that landed to some people as being homophobic and anti-trans, <clears throat> excuse me. And there are many people who say, okay, well, I'm not gonna have anything to do with any Harry Potter books anymore. There are other examples where someone has been accused and in some cases um, found to be guilty, um, not uh, in a court of law, but in the common sensibilities often on social media of negative behavior toward others and that people are banning their books or choosing not to read their books because of that behavior. And here are many authors, including Ellie Wiesel, Juno Diaz, uh, J.K. Rowling, Ernest Hemingway, and others who have been canceled, not because of the, any aesthetic or literary dimensions or considerations of their book, but because of their out of of text behavior, atextual behavior. And the reason why Sherman Alexi is on here um, and staying on here is because his banning, his censoring is really what brought me to this work in the first place. As a high school teacher, I found the work of Sherman Alexi to be incomparably engaging especially when I was in context with diverse students in classrooms in Minneapolis and St. Paul, the joy of having a student enter a text written by someone who shared some cultural understanding and heritage with them was priceless to me. I remember in a school in Minneapolis, having a student named Pine Funmaker come up to me and say, I've been, I've been waiting my whole life 
to read a book by a Native American author, thank you for that. In addition to that cultural aspect, it's the overall quality of his work and the level of engagement that I have found even reluctant readers to be able to have um, is something that I found to be um, irreplaceable. But Sherman Alexi has been accused of taking advantage of women, um, especially Native women writers and has experienced a huge backlash. So all of these books, one by one, have been disappearing from, I'll go back here, have been disappearing from the shelves of our classrooms. Some people say, well, Sherman Alexi is so problematic, maybe you could just substitute another author. Maybe you could substitute another Native American author, maybe someone as gifted as Tommy Orange. I just don't think that authors and their literary legacy and contributions can be replaced like cogs in the wheel can be reduced to a particular identity that they have, I think we need to think about them case by case. Some people say, well, maybe it's okay if the author is no longer living and won't glean any further residuals from teaching them. But that criteria doesn't really make sense to me. And I'd be interested in a, what you think about that as well. Another reason why books are currently being canceled, another element of the culture wars that has um, visited itself in our classrooms at whatever level is the notion of content being triggering and the call for trigger warnings. What does it mean for something to be triggering? One of the things that has been really complicating this issue is our increased understanding of the mental health and the vulnerabilities of our students K through college. That is not a bad thing. That is a good thing. It's good for us as educators to have a full and nuanced understanding of who is in our classroom and what kind of environment would be the most sustaining, safe, and productive for them. It's important for us to treat our students with care and to enact our own version of the physician's Hippocratic oath. First, do no harm. That's something that as a person who has been a teacher for more than four decades now, deeply believes in. And yet there are some topics that are triggering. There's no way to be able to teach students about the Holocaust, about slavery, about police brutality, about certain elements of families, of death, of dysfunction, without it being extremely difficult. Students ask for trigger warnings, or some people have found that perhaps it's a little less problematic to call them content warnings from the perspective of, and so what I wanna say about that is that yes, it's important to give someone notice, especially if you're in a public space, that some of what you may be talking about together as a community of learners could feel difficult and problematic. And to maybe give someone, a student, 
an opportunity to do some self-care that might range from leaving the classroom, from not being there that day, or from just stealing themselves against something that might be triggering for them. There's a couple of issues with kind of doing trigger warnings um, super frequently um, and without thinking about their consequences that I want to bring up. Uh, first of all, the research on trigger warnings really doesn't support their use in terms of the degree to which they can actually protect someone. So if someone is actually experiencing um, post-traumatic stress syndrome, if someone is at a level of vulnerability that even the mere mention of a topic might really unsettle them and create a kind of emotional and psychological dissonance that is really harm producing. Just saying, hey, we're about to do X doesn't necessarily um, protect them. And I think that's pretty interesting research that um, is continuing to go on and should inform our practice and our wholesale uh, adoption of trigger warnings. But from the perspective of what we are talking about this afternoon, from the perspective of literary study, of reading literature, there are many ways in which trigger warnings can be seen as literary spoilers. So some authors want you to be surprised in things fall apart. Achebe doesn't want you to get notice that his protagonist is going to kill himself. He wants you to be shocked by it, to be taken aback by it. So there are ways in which warning people about what might happen actually can undercut the overall value of the work itself. To this end, I want to share this quotation with you from Franz Kafka. He says, we need books that affect us like a disaster, that grieve us deeply like the death of someone we loved more than ourselves, like being banished into forests far from everyone, like a suicide. A book must be the ax for the frozen sea within us. That is my belief. And that is my belief too. It's my belief that one of the reasons why I became a teacher of literature was in addition to wanting to help create a site of empathy so that students could be able to live the lives of other people and under, for the duration of reading the book and understand what their challenges were, to feel their pain, to feel their grief, to be shocked by it, to move themselves out of a kind of complacency of self-protection. But I know, even as I share this quotation, that if I did it in my classroom, someone would say that even the word suicide would be potentially triggering for others. And therein lies the dilemma. So I've been talking to a lot of teachers across a variety of grade levels about what kinds of responses might be available to me as a teacher of troublesome texts and troublesome authors. And what I wanna say from the outset is that I'm well aware that I am 
speaking to you from the very blue state of Minnesota. What's relevant about that is that there isn't a chance that a teacher in the state of Minnesota is going to be arrested or fired or unfairly challenged or excoriated by a school board for the choices that they make. I think all of us are watching in this field and in other fields, the kind of culture war that is waged ferociously in states like Florida and California, uh, sorry, and Texas as well, um, where someone can get into deep trouble by showing a Disney movie that happens to have a gay identified character. So I wanna say that I feel and my fellow teachers of literature feel pretty lucky that we're in a place where people are adjudicating some of these issues very carefully. And yet it still comes into the classroom from a variety of perspectives. In the K-12 arena, it comes from concerned parents and other colleagues and administrators. In the college arena, it often comes from my beloved students themselves. So as I think about this, what are some options that might be available and what are the pros and cons of each? I think of it as kind of a spectrum where you could do nothing. You could just pretend that it's 25 years ago or even five years ago and teach what you're going to teach, say what you're going to say, do what you're going to do and let the chips fall where they may. That doesn't seem to be a very strategic, um, safe, or kind of informed way of operating from my perspective anyway. Or you can censor, and I cannot tell you the number of conversations that I have had with fellow teachers across all grade levels who are saying, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not gonna do this anymore. I'm not gonna teach this anymore. I'm not gonna offer this anymore. We're not gonna read this play, watch this film, read this text, analyze this poem, talk about this author because it's too problematic. So those are the opposite ends of the spectrum, neither one of which I think is particularly satisfying. So, here are some ways of thinking about uh, dealing with the culture wars in the literature classroom, because I feel the obligation as a teacher and as a scholar to not just raise our awareness of a important uh, issue, but to think through what are some solutions to that. And that's something that I tried really hard to do in my book, Literature in the New Culture Wars. So I will state a problem. And then at the end of the chapter, try to offer some teaching strategies or ways of thinking about the issue that might be helpful. One is to trouble the text, to teach the controversy. This is something that Jerry Graff talked about more than 20 years ago in his very influential book, Professing Literature, that you name it and you talk about it instead of making a decision a priori without the students. Students, we are going to be reading a text that has some problematic language in it, language that could be really, really hurtful. As a community of learners together, what should we do? Should we use the N-word? Should we not read anything out loud? Should we maybe decide as a community 
that the text is too painful for us to read, but in the discussion of the controversy lies more valuable education, education that gives students the opportunity to both develop and use their aesthetic and moral sensibilities as well. Too often, and, it, and right now, the left is as guilty of this as the right, a decision is made a priori to say, this is no longer appropriate for our classrooms. We're going to ban it from the classroom and not teach it at all. Sometimes, however, that can be the best decision. And if that's a decision to do, there's a couple of ways about that. One is to teach the book as an anchor text, but also offer alternative texts that maybe deal with similar subject matter that the student might feel more comfortable doing. Or perhaps it is no longer time to have 150 middle or high school students or college students read the same book for the same reason at the same time with during the same pace. Maybe it would be good to create a kind of cluster of related texts and have students make a choice and have the problematic text in some ways be decentered from its prime role in the classroom, but not be completely banished from the classroom itself. A similar idea and one that sometimes um, can feel like it creates a sort of intertextual dialogue is to read a text and then have a text that talks back to it, you know, so that there's ways in which you are acknowledging some of the problematic aspects of the anchor text itself, but the text exists in dialogue, in dialogue with a text that was written by someone who is literally talking back to it, so that you have both sides of both the social and literary issue within the context of the classroom. Another idea is to let the students decide. So recently in my work in a local high school, I was working with some wonderful teachers who I consider to be my thinking partners. And next up on our uh, curriculum was a Sherman Alexi novel. What we decided to do for the 11th and 12th grade combined class was to introduce the controversy of Sherman Alexi to them, let them read a couple of uh, articles about the outrage, um, let them read something from Sherman Alexi himself, let them read a couple of different reviews of the book we were going to, to introduce to them, give them a sense of you know what, if we didn't read that, we just want you to know that there's some controversy swirling around this. We don't want to hide it from you. We want to be upfront with you. And we don't want to make this decision for you because we think that you could judiciously make a decision yourself. So what we did is in, in, in a, a district that gave teachers um, mercifully that level of latitude in their curriculum, we decided to let the, the students decide for themselves. As it turned out, the students did decide to continue uh, to read uh, the Sherman Alexi novel. One thing that I am humbled by and have been for my 40 plus year career as a high school and college teacher is that I'm teaching other people's children. That's the title of a very important and influential book by the educational scholar Lisa Delpit. 
So what uh, I would like to broaden her application of it um, to a wider sphere and to say, I may have my own beliefs, my own moral compass, my own sense of what is and what isn't acceptable for young people. But those young people are not my children. Those young people may live in a different context that is familial, that is spiritual, that is religious, that is moral, that is political. And I think that it is disrespectful to ignore it. I also think it's problematic to have those spheres dictate the curriculum, but I think that there's some room in between those two potentially problematic goals. I think it's important to be in dialogue with parents, to not have parents. One of the issues when you see these school board meetings that parents tend to be outraged when, when they're surprised by what their kids are learning, when they're surprised by what their kids are reading. I think it behooves the teaching profession to try to have some efforts to help educate families and communities by inviting them into the schools, by having book clubs, by having conversations, by sending out letters that say, hi, I'm so delighted to have your student, your child in my eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade class. Here's an annotated bibliography of some of the things that we're going to be reading. And here are some of the issues that will spring from this from these texts. Let's have a conversation about what worries you, what concerns you, what pleases you, what delights you, and what you want me to keep in mind as I become a teacher of your child. And while on one hand, I don't think that parents have the right or the expertise to dictate curriculum, nor do I think that teachers have the right or the personal expertise to overrule parents. So I think there has to be something that is in between. Another thing is to invite guest speakers who've been impacted by the text, either positively or negatively, to share their perspective. Um, it still is the case in the state of Minnesota that while our student population is becoming increasingly diverse, our teaching force is still primarily white and female. There is only a certain band of human perspective that we can teach from our own identity positions. And rather than ventriloquize or silence or ignore the perspective of others, perhaps one of the things that we can do is to open up our classroom spaces to include more voices. And perhaps some of those voices might be the objecting family members themselves. Among the work that I've done is to use what I call critical lenses, which is really contemporary literary theory to help contextualize and trouble the text. I have a book called Critical Encounters in Secondary English. And the way that this got started was when I was doing kind of a guest teaching um, at South High School in Minneapolis, I was doing an independent study with a young woman who was short of uh, English credit and wanted to work with me. And I said, great, you can just choose a novel and we'll talk about it together and you can write a paper about it. And you know we can help fulfill your English credit that way. 
and any book you want. And she chose Lolita. I uh, don't love that book. I have issues as a reader and as a teacher with that book, but that was the book she chose. And I felt like I would be, you know, switching the conditions of our independent study by all of a sudden saying, no, you can't teach that. So I said to her, I'm happy to, to read that book with you. If at the same time, we can read some feminist literary theory and to use that theory to sort of trouble what it is that we're seeing in the text or to enlighten it in some ways. That's related to my first point, but it's a very specific literary way of doing that. And again, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail in the Q&A. So teaching literature in the new culture wars, what it means, it means being aware of the current moment in which we find ourselves. It means being sensitive to the ways in which that cultural moment may affect learners. It means that we need to consider carefully how the decisions that we make may personally and curricularly affect our students. But what it doesn't mean, I don't think, is not teaching a text just because of its content. It doesn't mean, excuse the double negatives, not teaching a text because of the behavior of the author. And it doesn't mean not facing the uncomfortable issues raised by texts and contexts. Um, so I would like to conclude with the uh, conclusion of my book. Um, and here's what I say. To read literature, is to learn to read the world in all of its complexities. The study of literature calls for a refocusing of the intellectual and affective work that literature can do and argues that there are ways to continue to teach troubling texts without doing harm. Let us consider the larger purpose of a literary education what it is that we want students to learn from reading texts. In addition to encountering the richness of well-written literature, even though we may not be able to agree on what it is, we also want students to glean a sense of history, to understand the interplay between social context and literature, to witness the evolution of social mores and ideas, to view things from multiple perspectives, to be able to inhabit the perspective of others, to develop empathy and to acquire some aesthetic sensibilities. By teaching rather than banning troubled and challenging literature, we can help students learn to decipher the world inscribed within those texts we read together and to help them read the world around them. Students can become the enlightened witnesses that Bell Hooks calls for, noting how power and privilege are inscribed all around us. And they can learn to read both texts and worlds with a nuance and critical eye. Our students can become, with our help, truly educated in the way James Baldwin envisioned, able to critique one's own society intelligently and without fear, Baldwin writes. The paradox of education is precisely this, that as one become, begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. The purpose of education, finally, is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to make his own decisions, to say to himself that this is black and this is white, to decide for himself whether there is a God in heaven or not, to ask questions of the universe, and then 
to learn to live with those questions. That's the way he achieves his own identity. But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. What societies really ideally want is a citizenry which will simply obey the rules of society. If a society succeeds in this, that society is about to perish. The obligation of anyone who thinks of himself is response, as responsible is to examine society and to try to change it and fight it at no matter what risk. This is the only hope society has. This is the only way society is changed. And now back to me, perhaps in the end, what we need is trust in what education can and should be. Trust in the reciprocal act of teaching and learning. Trust in the ability of teachers to navigate their students through difficult waters and trust in the kind of rich pedagogical strategies that we have collectively created. Perhaps most importantly, we need to trust our students to be able to learn to read words and worlds through a critical eye. We need to trust students to be able to parse out the harmful from the harmless, to read the world for themselves, and to develop both the critical strength and emotional resilience to notice harm and to resist it without it being kept from them by well-meaning, but perhaps over-vigilant teachers. Perhaps what these troubled times need is for us to continue teaching troubling texts and to trouble the ideologies inscribed therein rather than cancel or banish them. This is how I want to fight the culture wars. Our students deserve no less. Thank you so much. And now we can open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a number of questions in the Q&A and we're going to get to them. Um, I, uh, am, I think we have room for, for some more though. So if you are in the audience and you haven't typed your question into the Q&A, you can do it now and I will put those questions to our speaker. I'm gonna uh, ask you a question myself though for the first question. I was very interested in listening to your talk, particularly because I, I, I've loved literature all my life um, and I, um, I'd like to ask you to maybe use as a test case, a particular text that has moved me so greatly and it seems to be so difficult to teach now. Perhaps you could tell me how you might apply some of the specifics that you discussed to uh, Huckleberry Finn. There's a, a section in Huckleberry Finn that I cannot read without bursting into tears. And I think you probably know what it is. It's when Huckleberry Finn says, okay, he's gonna go to hell rather than betray uh, Jim. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I really, I think how, I want other people, I want younger people to have the experience of that great piece of literature. But that moment is so hedged around with the N-word, with, with Mark Twain's slashing satire, which probably isn't necessarily obvious to, you know, young people 150 years later. How would you apply the techniques you were talking about to that text? Right. Thank you so much for that question. And it's really true that Adventures of Huckleberry Finn you know, is one of the most commonly challenged books. Um, I, I want to say two things. One is that um, my argument is not necessarily the, an argument for the preservation of the canon. So what I want to say is that all of us need to rethink, you know, what we're teaching and why. So it mm -hmm. may be at some point that we decide not to teach Huck Finn anymore. It's amazing that the high school literary canon is you know almost exactly the way it was when I was in high school you know more than years ago so I want to first admit the possibility for uh -huh. teachers to rethink the curriculum and whether Huck Finn will survive it or not is not up to say what I would uh -huh. do 
teaching that book because I completely agree with you, Judy, that there is so much in it that is so valuable and worthwhile and irreplaceable in some ways is that I would I would front load and do a lot of pre-teaching. There's mm -hmm. you know a great book on the N-word and talks about the history and its troublesomeness. I would have students read about that before we even cracked open up Ben. You know, I might have some community members, some speakers come in. We might listen to some um, rap, some lyrics. We might talk about the difference mm -hmm. between who is doing the speaking, who is using the word, those kinds of things. We might talk together about how it lands for us individually and what we could do as a community of learners um, when we're going to see it. I might preview some sections or preview some sentences and talk to students about it. I think one of the things that happens in classrooms are that students are taken by surprise, that they're not forewarned. What you do before you teach a text is actually more important than what you do while you're teaching a text. So one of the things that I learn and teach my future uh, English teachers is, is that there's pre-teaching, during teaching, and post-teaching. And too often we just focus on what happens when we're engaging with that text. Another mm -hmm. thing that I might do is to send a note home to family and to say, this is what we're thinking about. This is what we're going to do. Let's talk a little bit about what are the ways, because nobody learns anything when they're feeling completely hurt and displaced. So I think, mm -hmm. there, I, I think two opposite things. One, there are ways of preserving it. And we also give our need to give ourselves permission to consider not to preserve it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, let's turn to our questions, of which there are quite a few by now. Uh, first questioner or first comment says, you seem to conflate the idea of banning an author with an individual choosing not to read. To me, banning means making it so that others cannot read a book. And could you uh, address that maybe in the context of teaching? Right. So the thing about high school and middle school students is that they don't have much of a choice of choosing to yeah. read or not if it's in the curriculum. One of the things that happened with Sherman Alexie is that his books were removed from school libraries. Mm -hmm. They were taken off. That to me is banning. That is removing the choice. So mm -hmm. as an adult reader, you are absolutely correct. You have the right to choose or not to choose what it is that you want to read. But high school and middle school students and elementary students are not generally given that authority. Similarly, and this, again, is especially true in other states beside Minnesota, are having the choice of curriculum taken away from them. So, you know, the sort of DeSantis, anti-woke um, mm -hmm. movement is to make it possible, or let's put it this way, to make it impossible to use certain books, ideas, themes and authors in the curriculum. So to mm -hmm. me, that's an example of banning. And, you know, just to clarify in case I, I wasn't clear enough is that I'm talking about how the culture wars are animated within the context of the classroom, within mm -hmm. the context outside of the classroom, whether it's a book club or an individual reader's choice, of course, the idea of the difference between banning and choosing not to read is very important indeed. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, here's a comment. This person says, I definitely do not think behavior outside of the text should result in cancellations. And I would imagine that many in the audience agree with this person. I'm going to flip it around and say, is there any behavior that is so egregious uh, that it would? Uh, uh, result in, in, or should result in uh, uh, dropping a text? Yeah, that is such a great question. And it's one that I think about a lot. And I don't think about it just in terms of literature. Think about mm -hmm. the 
music that we listen to and think about the ways in which, you know, certain composers might have been implicated in some negative and horrific, you know, political. Um, Woody Allen. You know, think about Woody Allen and his films, you know, think about, you know, film, music, art, think about, you know, the, the misogynist that Picasso was, think about all of those kinds of things. So to me, I think it's important to think about the arena, the arena in which someone has been, helped, it's being punished. So yeah. Harvey Weinstein deserves to be in prison. He is in prison. Does that mean that every film that was produced by Miramax should not be viewed, right? So I still believe in separating the art from the artist and to be able to apprehend the art itself, whether it's a novel, a short story, or a play, you know, from the behavior of the artists themselves. And to get back to the first person's question, as a consumer of art, we can decide, we can say, I have friends who won't ever see a Woody Allen film again. I think they're gonna be missing <laughs> some great films, but I understand how they came to that decision. One of the issues that I have is I'm speaking for students who don't have a voice in this often, and I'm also speaking for the imperiled teachers who increasingly are having their voice being taken away from them. You know, so we all have our own, you know, moral compass. You know, I think that one of the things that I, I mentioned uh, briefly that I'm also a prison teacher. You know, I teach at several correctional facilities in the state of Minnesota. You know, I teach people who have been convicted of heinous crimes. The, what I've learned from that is that there's ways in which as human beings that it's really important for us to understand the totality of the human being, to be able to think about the qualities of mercy the qualities of forgiveness, the ways in which we are all more than the worst thing that we've ever done. It seems, especially in social media, that there's no room for forgiveness. This is one, and I'm not arguing for people to forgive either Harvey Weinstein, Woody Allen, or Sherman Alexie. That is not my place to do it. But I think that there is like an unforgiving relentlessness of the kind of viciousness with which certain authors and artists have been treated in social media. You know, very recently, a group of music students were going to go to Orchestra Hall, just this was a voluntary um, gesture to listen to some new theme music for Harry Potter. And all, there was this kind of student outrage. How can you support anything that has anything to do with Harry Potter when J.K. Rowling said this, this, and this? And like the composer wasn't even J.K. Rowling. And there was like a kind of absolutism, which is almost the opposite of the kind of relativism of thinking that psychologists like William Perry say, we're supposed to be in the business of developing among our students. Things aren't black and white. And so- you know, everyone would have their own threshold of no matter what, I'm not going to do this. I personally am not going to the state of Florida right now because I don't want to support an economy that has these kind of draconian educational policies. And yet I have friends who, you know, just got back from a fabulous time in Naples. So um, I think that we all have to make our moral choices. We've gotten a couple, several questions about uh, the uh, example of Sherman Alexie and, and banning his uh, works, canceling his works. Uh, one uh, question in particular says, I wonder about the idea of replacing Alexie with another Native American writer. Could that be interpreted as they're all alike? Yes, I applaud, I applaud the sentiment behind that question. And that's kind of what I alluded to when I was talking about how people say, well, yeah, let's just read Tommy Orange instead. Sherman mm -hmm. Alexie 
is a Native American author. He's an author. And I think that, you know, we don't say about authors who belong to the dominant culture, you know, well, we're out of Hemingway books right now. Let's just, you know, do some Fitzgerald instead. They're not, you're, they're not replaceable. They're not cogs in the machine that have a lot in common. Sherman Alexi has a voice, a perspective, a history, a way of world making that's like no other. And it also depends on the ways, the reasons for including his work in the first place. Yes, we want to diversify our curriculum. And by the way, it's also been authors of color who have been the most banned and canceled and censored yes. because some of those authors might be more likely to include some realistic um, portrayals, characters that others find problematic. So I completely agree with the questioner that it's not mm -hmm. about replacing. There is no replacement for it, in my opinion. Speaking of the banning of authors of color, the next questioner uh, talks about Amanda Gorman, the uh, young poet at the uh, Biden inauguration. Her poetry was banned recently in Florida. Do you know why? What, what is the offense in her poetry? Um, I think that what, what's going on in Florida, I know that was like completely shocking. So what's going on in Florida and how Amanda Gorman, first of all, first of all, one parent who happened to have a seat on a school board objected to it. Yeah. And so that's an example of the imbalance of you know, voices and power that we have to rethink. Yes, in my talk, I encouraged us to respect and, and elicit parent opinion and involvement. But it is really shocking to think that one individual parent who for some reason didn't like Amanda Gorman's poem um, had the power to have it be removed. Yeah. What is she is being painted with the brush um, that also, you know, the AP African American history um, curriculum is being painted is that any attempts, I mean, it's hard for me to say this really without crying, but that any attempt to lift up or to valorize the African American experience in the joyful elements of it and to remind people of the pain attached to it is, is seen as being anti-white. It's like the zero sum game that the more time that we spend on celebrating and raising up African-American experience, there's ways in which the white students are suffering from that. And that is part of the heart. Uh, I mean, I can't logically explain, you know, why her um, poem is being banned because it's illogical, because it defies logic. So those are ways in which it's really hard to have these kinds of arguments because it takes two logical sides to have a productive uh, debate. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to do is to see things from the other side, to grant what what validity they may have and to have us be able um, to talk about it together. But I would agree that that is among the most chilling, very mm -hmm. recent examples of a culture war and who will lose? It's our students who will lose from being yeah. able to have that beautiful poem be woven into their growing mm -hmm. literary heritage. Mm -hmm. We have a, a, a couple of questions, several questions really, about the issue of triggering. Um, that's a, a somewhat novel concept to anybody who went to school many, many years ago. Um, how do you draw the, how do you balance between something that will traumatize a student and the, the maybe necessary or, or desirable amount of shock that, that should be introduced as part of the educational process. A lot of us went to college in order to encounter things that, that would leave us uncomfortable. How as the teacher do you balance 
the, the very different needs of, of uh, students with very different backgrounds when it comes to triggering? Yeah, this is a question that keeps me up at night. I think about it all of the time. I think about it every time I walk into a classroom. So, I mean, you know, I consider myself to be a caring uh, teacher who does not, who wants to nurture and help develop um, mm -hmm. students and to not hurt them. I don't want to traumatize them. Um, on the other hand, I think that we are in many cases overstating our students um, ability to be triggered in a classroom. I'm not, I mean, would that literature was that powerful <laughs> that you would read something and you would be so completely traumatized by it. You would read something about war and you would say to yourself, I could never ever support any military involvement because this has triggered me and I'm so traumatized. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to think that literature has that level of power. So would Franz Kafka and James Baldwin, but I'm not sure that it does. So number one, I am skeptical that students will really be traumatized. And I think that on one hand, although I acknowledge the mental health crisis that students are in post COVID and with social media exacerbating it, those are real, I'm not going to minimize it. I do think that sometimes we take it a little bit too far, you know, and that and there's a difference between being made uncomfortable and being hurt. So uncomfortable learning is actually what I'm going for. And I don't think that that necessarily means that I'm hurting students. I also sometimes think that if somebody lived through something, the least we can do is read about it. Do we have a moral obligation to be witnesses? Mm -hmm. and the way yeah. that we become witnesses is through literature. And it's like, really, in the comfort of your liberal arts education, you're going to spend a couple of hours feeling really uncomfortable about learning about a life that was minute by minute filled with trauma and pain. You know what? You can do that. You need to do that. So I tend to err on the side of saying, let's go for it by creating a classroom environment where my students trust that I'm not going to hurt them. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that I am going for it sometimes a little bit more than some of my colleagues who are saying, no, I just don't want them to feel uncomfortable do. I understand the reasons for that, but I'm going to err on the side of not giving the triggers. Isn't part of the problem, though, the differential impact of the potential trigger? 29 students in the class have not been raped, but one has. And so the impact of reading about a rape differentially impacts that one student. How do you balance that situation, the, the 29 to the one? And doesn't talking about it, it to discuss it beforehand, further uh, stigmatize the student who has been uh, you know, uh, undergone the, 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 the trauma. Right. I mean, that last point is part of what complicates it, because if I say, you know, we're going to be talking about X, and if you feel kind of affected by X, you can leave, their absence is visible, right? And then it, then it's calling things out. I mean, yeah. I think a couple of things, you know, thing number one is that the more you know about your students, Mm -hmm. or you can make judicious choices. You sure. know, I remember being a high school teacher and on, we were going to read um, Carl Shapiro's auto wreck, um, but the week before um, a student had lost a family member in a car accident. I knew mm -hmm. that because I knew yeah. the student, and we didn't read the mm -hmm. poem. It's like yeah. not reading the poem. And I'm not sure. going to say, oh, Johnny, you know, I hear that, you know, your uncle was just killed on the highway. Yeah, yeah. I not do that. So it's yeah. sort of the more you know the nuances of your student's context, mm -hmm. the more you're able to let that inform your curriculum, not that you're going to know everything. Um, and so I think that balancing it out so there's the 29 and then there's the one. I don't mm -hmm. think 
but not having the 29 read it necessarily um, is the best solution. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think that we need to think more deeply about what does it mean to confront something and what are the ways in which, uh, yeah, a literature classroom is not therapeutic. I am not mm -hmm. a therapist, you know, yes. I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think there are ways that talking together about particular kinds of issues and experiences in a room full of people who are caring and trusting and working toward the, the same educational goal with mm -hmm. a person whose job it is, who's getting paid to like take care of you and help you learn is one of the best places to do that. The yeah. other day when we were having a panel on triggering and a student uh, at Carleton and a student raised their hand and said, you know, well, what if I just leave? You know, what is lost when I leave the classroom? And my immediate response is everything is lost when you leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. we just lost you. And then yeah. our community of learners is different. So mm -hmm. on one hand, having people take that self-care and being able to remove themselves from a potentially triggering situation is something that I fully understand but it is also not without cost itself. Yeah. We have questions on a specific uh, uh, incident of uh, triggering. Uh, could you speak to the Hamlin adjunct professor's situation? Uh, the professor who was not, whose contract was not renewed because uh, she showed an image of the Prophet Muhammad. She had actually provided students with content warnings prior to showing the image, but the student, uh, who complained still uh, felt that she was a victim of cultural insensitivity. Uh, could you comment on that? I, I think most of the audience is aware of, the, of that situation. Could you comment on that, please? Sure. I mean, one of the things that um, we've been talking about a lot at Carlton and other spaces as well is kind of the potential uh, collision between academic freedom and our, in, our important and increasingly awareness of inclusion, diversity, and equity. And sometimes those things will kind of come into um, play the way that they did at Hamlin. As a professor, what I can, what my opinion is about that situation is that that teacher did absolutely everything and more than most yeah would have done to help acknowledge and prepare her students for what she was going to show. It was on the syllabus. They knew it was coming. She said it was coming that day. Students had permission to leave if they needed to leave. And, and there was still a complaint. What is a problem with the complaint is that she was immediately accused of Islamophobia. And yes. so this is an example of like a lack of nuance. There isn't even agreement within the, the Muslim community about the yes. degree to which that image was offensive. So, mm -hmm. you know, the ways in which, first of all, uh, there are so many issues in the Hamlin one. One is preparing your students, doing everything you can. And in this particular case, she did. The other mm -hmm. is, what do you assume about the teacher's motivations? We are all human beings. And that means that we are going to make mistakes. As, as careful as I am, I am sometimes going to mispronoun a student. And I'm not going to do it to hurt them. I'm going to do it by accident. I'm going to yeah. feel terrible. It's going to be awful. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm transphobic. I owe yeah. them an apology. But there's this sort of level of judgment about who someone is and what they stand for by one mm -hmm. thing that they do, right? And in this case, she didn't even really do anything wrong. So yeah. to me, this is something that I talked about earlier about the relentless kind of cancelization that is like so brutal that there was mm -hmm. no nuance to the, the subject. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that as our classrooms become increasingly diverse, 
as there are more and more different kinds of things that could trigger different people, we are going to be skating on thin ice. And what we need to do, as I said in the last section of my book, is that we need to trust that if somebody mm -hmm. did something yes. that hurt somebody somehow, that it wasn't because they meant to, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they hold these negative um, perspectives yeah. as well. I think that the Hamlin situation is a very significant cautionary tale for the ways in which the culture wars are playing out among well-meaning people. Um, and it's incredibly unfortunate. And I hope that all of us, both in higher education and otherwise, um, can learn from it. Yeah. Okay, now a bit of a departure. Uh, this person says, I like the idea of teachers holding conversation with parents around these issues, but I wonder how the communication happens. I myself often find that teachers ignore my comments. Yes. Um, one of the things is that sometimes schools are not aware of parents' schedules, as especially a household that has, you know, two working parents or a household with a single um, parent that has a working parent. So they offer these times for people to come in during the day when there's no time for them to come in during the day. So one thing that I suggest that I did as a high school teacher, you know, was to have times in the early evening when, you know, parents could come in or like a donut time before work, like it's between 7.30 and 8.30 on your way to work, stop by, here are the books that I'm having, your students read, let's talk about it. Or letters or emails or Zoom calls, like having an open meeting, kind of like you know we're having in the same format that you're having right now, you know, to have a webinar, okay. You know, you all have questions about critical race theory, what it is, what it isn't, who's teaching it, who's not teaching it, what it looks like. I'm going to have a free webinar. Um, all you have to do is just show up to this Zoom link on critical race mm -hmm. theory. You can ask your questions and, you know, we can talk about it. So there's lots of ways in which I think parents can be invited. And I think that the education profession has not done a good enough job of it. A one, one school that I know um, actually goes door to door in their North Minneapolis neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. before school starts, before the school year starts, knocking on, on doors, um, saying, hi, I'm going to be your child's teacher. Here I am. Mm -hmm. What questions do you have for me? You know, it's going, um, I won't even say it's going above and beyond, but it's making mm -hmm. an extra effort to do that. Yeah. So I do think that there are ways, and I'm not sure that we have been engaging in those ways that are available yeah. to us. Um, the next questioner is interested in the distinction between removing a, a book from a library or using a book in a classroom. Uh, th there is a distinction there, and uh, uh, he says, are we hearing primarily from the extremes in the case of books removed from a library? W would you want to talk about that, the, the, the distinction between making the book available and assigning the book, I guess, is what's the issue here? Yeah, and I really appreciate that question because I actually think that there's a solution to some of these issues in that question. So. You're absolutely right. Some books are being removed. Uh, here's the thing. Some books are experiencing both. They're being removed from the library and they're being removed from the curriculum. Some books are only being removed from the library, but some people are still teaching them, right? And so some books are uh, not available in either space. What might be possible is if it's um, difficult for it to become a regular part of a state sanctioned or locally sanctioned curriculum to allow there to be some kind of mechanism of independent reading on the part of some students, you know, reader's choice, those kinds of things where they could go to the library and then get the book. 
The sad thing would be is if the teacher can't teach it because it's not part of the curriculum, but it's not in the library either, yeah. not going to be able to do it. But I think that it's absolutely true that the book list for the library and the book list for the curriculum are absolutely not the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, we uh, have fewer than uh, 10 minutes left, and we have more questions than we did uh, when we started. So I'm afraid we're not going to get to all the questions. And I do apologize to our audience because these are extremely good, thoughtful questions. But we're going to push right through and, and see how many we can get to. Um, in some cases, I'm going to condense things a little bit just for the, the time involved. Um, here's a person who says, the problem is that K-12 and universities are fully captured by the left. Rightists are concerned that teachers will only teach from the left and they don't trust teachers uh, to teach critical thinking. Uh, and I'm going to leave it there just for the purposes of time. Could you comment on that? It's probably true that most uh, professors, most teachers are more likely to be on the left politically than on the right. So how can the, a, a person trust you, <laughs> in right. essence, if their politics are different? Uh I don't think that that's true. I think that it's more true for university professors. There are definitely mm -hmm. in some interesting research that demonstrates the, you know, the ideological leanings of mm -hmm. professors. So I won't argue that. I don't think that that's true. K through 12, I think there's a lot of political diversity in K through 12. The thing about it is that what you need to trust is that I'm not an indoctrinator. I'm not teaching a particular kind of political philosophy. My mm -hmm. goal, even left-leaning people's goal, is not to turn students into um, communists or socialists. <laughs> my goal is to teach my subject matter. And whether it's biology or English or math, any teacher, you know, who, who really fulfills their obligation is to teach their subject matter. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we are not in a position of power to be able to influence and teachers are not indoctrinators. We do not go into that profession to indoctrinate. If mm -hmm. I wanted, I, I feel like anyone who's been a teacher would realize how difficult it is to indoctrinate students, even if you wanted to. I can't even indoctrinate them to come to class on time sometimes. So it's sort of like, if I wanted to be in a space that tried to convince people of my point of view and my point of view alone, I would not be an educator. And most educators that I know would say exactly the same thing. Trust us, we have your child's education and best interests at heart. We really, really do. Okay. Um, it seems that most of the Florida controversy really relates to age appropriateness for certain kinds of education. Um, it's not that they're banning uh, sex education, they're banning sex education at very young ages, for example. How, how do you propose to, to deal with that age. Maybe to read about the Holocaust at, in the second grade is not appropriate, uh, as parents might say. How, how do you, how do you uh, uh, deal with that issue of age appropriate? Right, so um, I'll, I'll agree and then I'll give a counter example. So yeah, okay. I teach educational psychology and one of the things we talk about is developmental appropriateness for a curriculum. I mean, I once went to a school that um, in a, another state that was having trouble with their seventh graders being able to read great expectations. And I said, don't even pay me. Keep your money. Here's what I want to tell you. That book is too hard for seventh graders. I'm going to take the next plane out. I mean, this is not developmentally appropriate mm -hmm. Even for topics that aren't controversial. Uh, we need to think of developmental appropriateness and different people will make different judgments. So, yes. There are some times when it's too early for a person to learn about something. They don't have the cognitive capacity or what mm -hmm. developmental psychologists talk about in terms of formal operations. 
to be able to understand those things. But in the case of the AP African-American history, that was mm -hmm. snatched away from 11th and 12th graders. Those yeah. young people are perfectly capable and actually need to read more about our history. Mm -hmm. And so, well, I would agree that some of the more salacious examples of sex, sex education, transgender issues um, at the elementary level, may be, uh, it may be valid to raise the issue of age appropriateness. That is not singularly the criteria by which certain things are being removed in the classroom in Florida, at least. Yeah. Um, your, this uh, uh, questioner says, uh, your recommendations are laudable, but are they achievable? Uh, do you have examples of schools or districts that have attempted to mitigate the, the problems through some of your recommendations? Could you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, I currently work with teachers, you know, throughout the state and in other states as well. We have like amazing, amazingly resilient, smart, intellectual teachers all over the metropolitan area and throughout the state and in other states as well, who are thinking about these things all of the time, who are not casting a blind eye, who take their responsibility really seriously and who do it and can do it, and luckily are given the space in our state at least to try. I think of these people as my thinking partners. I learned from them. And mm -hmm. I that we need to give more credit. You know, one of the issues with the previous question about left leaning is that we need to trust and respect our teachers who are doing a really, really difficult job really, really well. Most of them are doing that. And we need the respect and not suspicion of our students' parents so that we can work together as a team to forward their education. All of my suggestions were tested in a classroom before I put them into the book. So I'm happy to talk about that in more detail um, with other people. Um, you know, as we run out of time, I can say, you know, you can definitely email me. I'm totally easy to find. Um, I'm at Carleton College and um, I'd be happy to continue the conversation as well. I must read the next question because it's very close to my heart. This person says, when I was young, the public library was my refuge to find books not available in school. I felt it was up to my parents to monitor what I, they felt it was up to my parents to monitor what I read. I hate that this has changed. And I would like to say, as the uh, chair of the Protested Materials Committee at the Ramsey County Library, this has changed less than you think. And if you think that the public library in uh, our area are removing books, uh, please talk to me. But now I'll turn over because really the question is directed to you. <laughs> well, uh, Judy, I just want to, um, I just want to agree with what you said. I mean, you know, I call myself a reluctant culture warrior, um, but I would say that uh, on the battlefield with me are librarians. So I yeah. think that the most courageous people in this culture war have been the librarians who for years and years and years have fought for teachers' rights to teach certain material. Again, we're noticing the challenge coming from different parts of the political spectrum. But I truly yeah. think for the question asker that your library is just as much of an intellectual refuge as it was before, um, depending on where you're calling, your question is coming from, um, but I really think that people have definitely been resisting and challenging the removal of books, and I, for one, am very grateful to librarians as being just incomparable allies in this work. I am so sorry, but we are out of time. I could absolutely go on for hours and hours on this topic and it looks like by the number of questions that we have remaining uh, our audience would be with us for quite a ways um, unfortunately we are through so i'm going to have to uh, 
conclude by thanking uh, Professor Deborah Appleman. Uh, thanks to Carmi Blyfus. Thanks to Grace and Simmons behind the scenes. Thank you so much to the audience who had such excellent questions. We are saving the rest of the questions. If anybody's interested in what did not get asked, uh, you can contact me. Uh, I'm going to look them over myself because I know they're going to be interesting. Um, I hope everyone comes back next week. We're going to change topics uh, drastically. Next week, we will have Julia Steenberg, who is from the Minnesota Geological Survey. Her topic will be a Minnesota meteor. What can it tell us? So please come back next week. But for right now, we're going to have to say goodbye and thank you to everyone. Thank you.